everyone. Thank you for attending our 2020 Exhibit Columbus Symposium New Middles and our Columbus conversation today. My name is Ann Surak and I'm the director of Exhibit Columbus. For those of you joining us for the first time or those new to our work, Exhibit Columbus is a program of the Landmark Columbus Foundation, whose mission is to care for, celebrate, and advance the cultural heritage of Columbus, Indiana. Exhibit Columbus creates a two-year cycle of programming that activates the design legacy of Columbus through symposia and a free public exhibition. Our 2020 symposium begins our third cycle of events and asks international leaders in architecture, art, and design together with stakeholders in our community to consider the question, what is the future of the middle city? This is the last in a series of eight live streamed and recorded online conversations and is centered around the topic, indigenous futures and radical thinking. Over the last six weeks, we've explored three other topics in this format, Tuesday thematic conversations hosted by our media partner, Dazeen, and Thursday Columbus conversations hosted by Exhibit Columbus through Zoom and Facebook Live. Please visit our website, exhibitcolumbus.org, for the archive of talks already presented. We also invite you to join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using hashtags New Middles and Exhibit Columbus, and follow us at, at Exhibit Columbus. Our conversation today will be moderated by Dr. Scott Shoemaker. Scott is the Idle Drug Museum's Thomas G. and Susan C. Hobart Curator of Native American Art, History, and Culture. He is a citizen of the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and a direct descendant of Chief Mito Sania, one of the Miami leaders who signed the Treaty of St. Mary's in 1818. Originally from Kokomo, Indiana, Scott has been active in the revitalization of the Miami language and the art of ribbon work for over 20 years. Welcome, Scott, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Anne. I am Ewe Malaka Koke, Te Pake, Neolaka Koke, Nungishai Pawe, Papagama Wenzuani, Nila Miamito Senia, Miam Yongonji Wonji, E Honji Metama Kindiki. Kinduke ke piowachik miamia ke mishmaha ne he ewe ma ke ke mishingo mija ke ne shipa kana ke chika kwe ne machi sengwe sipa ongonje kya yangi nungi oyaki ani waha chingwa tanongi. So uh, I introduce myself in uh, Miami language, uh, which is the original language of this land uh, where we are today. Um, and so I said, my, I introduce myself, who I am, where I come from, who I'm related to, and those places that I'm related to as well. Um, so I'm a Miami person. I'm a human being. Um, my families are the Mishingamashas and the Shipakanas, also known as the Bundy Slocums. And we come from along the Mississinawa River in north central Indiana. Um, and our word for that river translates as the Slanting River. And today I live in the place of the falls, also known as Indianapolis. So um, this is a part of Miam Myonge, um, a part of Miami land. Um, the city of Columbus is kind of on the, the southern um, area of that. Uh, where I am in Indianapolis is a part of that too. Uh, and this is a this is a landscape that um, is a place where we've lived since time immemorial. Um, but it's also been a place that we've shared with others over time, um, namely our relatives, the Delawares, the Shawnees, Kickapoos, um, and Potawatomis to our north. Um, and through, um, through a series of treaties, um, through colonization, um, uh, we ceded a, a, this vast stretch of our homelands to the United States um, within a short amount of time and uh, spanning from the late 18th to the mid 20th century, which eventually called for our removals. Um, and so um, that created a diaspora for a lot of the indigenous peoples of this region, um, some seeking refuge all the way into Canada and even into Mexico. Uh, most of us are um, uh, situated in Oklahoma or Kansas. Um, so we're, we're, we've scattered um, through that process um, and some of us did re were allowed to remain. Um, so some of my ancestors had exemptions from removal and, and our Potawatomi relatives to the North Pokagon Band also had exemptions. Um, but despite all of this, that we still have deep connections to this place uh, and to one another. Um, so I always like to remind people of, of that history. Um, and so I think that 
um, it's important um, when you acknowledge um, the indigenous peoples of that place that you're also acknowledging your responsibilities to those peoples, to that land, and then thinking of the um, the movements that have been created of other indigenous peoples into this place. So thinking of that relationship and responsibilities that we have to those peoples, indigenous peoples from elsewhere that live here now. Um, and so I think it's important to keep that in mind as, as we um, talk about this. And one thing that I just wanted to kind of share um, that really came to mind as I was listening to the conversations on Tuesday, um, which were really wonderful, uh, and thinking of this idea of middle. And so I automatically kind of go to uh, my language and uh, so much of our ancestral knowledge is embedded within that. And for me, uh, one, of those, one of those key words that um, thinking of like, well, how do we say middle or center in our language? And one of those words that comes out of that is pasakaha, uh, which means to be in the midst of relation to other things, peoples, non-human non beings, um, in, in sort of in the midst of relationships. Um, and then another term is popsakaha, which means to be in constant um, sort of movement and relationships. So that, that idea that that center or middle isn't static, um, that it's not just in one place, but it moves and that there's relationships that are created throughout that. So that's something that um, that got me thinking about how all of these are tied together. Um, and so um, I'm really excited about what the, the conversations uh, will come out of this. Um, and I'd like to first um, introduce Whitney Amuchas, Amuchas, Amuchastegui. Um, and so Whitney joined uh, Sukasa in 2018 as executive director, having spent the last three years working at BCSC in the English Learning Department. There she participated in the establishment of the Cultural Learning Center, promoting the integration of international families into the community, supporting Latino young talent, and encouraging multicultural expression in the schools. She is a strong proponent of human rights and positive youth development in our community. Whitney is from Canada and comes, uh, comes to Columbus by way of Chile, Uruguay, and Argentina, where she spent eight years. Her previous roles have been in the graphic design field, working for Mayor, Mayor Michael Bloomberg and the Economic Development Corporation in New York City, and the Turismo Sustainable arm of the Tourism Secretary in Chile. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, and thank you to the host of Exhibit for inviting me here to be here with you today. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity for, uh, for Sukasa um, to talk a little bit about what we do. So I really appreciate you loaning your time with me. Um, <clears throat> I am just going to share with you a brief PowerPoint that I have just to talk a little bit about what we do at Sukasa. Our mission is to really serve as a cultural bridge between the Hispanic and non-Hispanic communities of Bartholomew County and Jackson County, which is just to our south. And we do that in two ways. One is by working with Latino families um, to get them, make sure that they have what they need to reach self-sufficiency once they move here. And the other is by participating in events like these and providing events to celebrate culture and create awareness about the different cultures in our community. Um, but to go back a little bit to the first part of that sentence and talk a bit about why we, why there is a need for a cultural bridge at all. Um, and that is because in the last 10 years, our area has and seeing a strong increase in immigration, um, particularly from Latin American countries. In Bartholomew County, BCSC has seen a 250% increase in the number of Latinos, and they represent about 17% of the total population of the school corporation. And in Seymour, it's actually been 480%. And they now represent maybe 36% of the total population 
Um, so one, you'll notice that my numbers are all from the school corporation because those are the most reliable numbers that we have. Um, census numbers tend to be a little bit misleading. Um, and the other is just, you can imagine how um, such a strong wave of immigration would have an effect on a community. And we are there to really ensure that that is positive, celebrated, and um, something that will continue. So <clears throat> we can't, when we think about the Latino self-sufficiency piece of it, uh, we like to, we're playing the long game and we start at the, you know, youngest levels. Um, we are lucky to have partners who already work with student or kids, babies from birth to age five, and then another group that works with uh, students in secondary school. So we really try to focus in the elementary or primary part of education to ensure that those students have what they need to hit their own running in math and reading once they hit secondary. Um, and we do that by providing after school and uh, summer programming. And these are important because a lot of families, even no matter how, um, how well intended they are, they're, they, you know, they get to a point where there, is, there are language barriers, cultural barriers, educational barriers, and even practical barriers that may stand in the way of them um, assisting their student, their children to, or um, the children that they, uh, that they care for, get to where they need to be um, in school with their homework and in, during studies during the summer. Um, so we try to prevent that kind of slide um, and work with them after school on their homework and during the summer, providing them with STEM activities and um, reading activities to keep them engaged during that time and make sure that they're, they're really, they have what they need to do well in the next school year. This is an example of, um, of one of our partners, which is Cummins, coming in to do some wonderful STEM activities um, with the kids. Uh, so we're really grateful for all of the collaboration that we do within the community. Um, <clears throat> but we can't expect those kids to do well if they come home at night and are concerned about, you know, whether they're going to have a roof over their head or have food on the dinner table. And that is why historically we have always worked with parents and caregivers and other family members to ensure that they have what they need to, to succeed. Um, and so that started 20 years ago when our organization began um, and we provided basic needs services, which really um, run the gamut between, you know, interpretation and translation to serving as a connection to the many resources within our community um, so that they have the advocacy they need to um, to represent themselves properly. Um, what, whether that be through uh, translation or just making sure that there is a positive advocate. Um, but we have since extended those services to include coaching because while before we used to really focus on problem solving, <clears throat> now we're looking at a person's life or a family's life in um, a holistic sense in their family stability, health and wellness, education, employment, and financial stability or literacy. And this is an example here of a employment readiness class that we created with Cummins and um, McDowell Adult Education uh, to ensure that these, um, that our students could have an opportunity to upskill and potentially position themselves for more leadership roles within their workplace, um, which is important for their you know progress obviously we have a number of people who have um held jobs in um manufacturing production in the service industry here in our area 
um, and would like to grow within those areas. And so we try to give them the tools that they need in order to do so. Um, <clears throat> but we can't do what we do without the help of volunteers. And we're really lucky to be able to have some incredible volunteers. Um, these are uh, our vecinas. And the word vecina translates directly to a, um, a female neighbor. Um, and they, these women live in neighborhoods where there are high populations of Latinos and they serve as kind of our boots on the ground, the first point of contact for our clients to our office. Um, and this has been incredibly important for us during this, uh, during the pandemic where we were limited uh, because we could not access our office and we could not have people come in. Um, these wonderful women were able to identify people in need, um, refer them to us, and so that we could get them the financial assistance that they required to keep their family going and um, food on the table. Um, so we are very grateful for their work. Now, going back to the beginning, we have um, always provided different events throughout the year um, that celebrate the Latino heritage and culture, um, but also provide advocacy for them. And this is one example of a group of students that we helped organize an event to respond to the administration's um, uh, restrictions on, um, on DACA students. This, is, this event was celebrating and advoca advocating for them. Um, and we, we really are lucky in our community to have so many supporters of um, not only these students, but the Latino community as a whole. Now, <laughs> to um, round this up, um, celebration is a big part of um, our culture and um, we were lucky enough to create an event with Landmark uh, last year to help kick off their um, exhibit and um, last year uh, there were a number of designers who were actually coming from Mexico um, and so uh, we all wanted to be able to celebrate that and bring awareness to that and learn more about their, um, their presentations. So we created this event um, that um, included dancers and um, some words from some of the leaders within our community. Um, and we were very grateful for that opportunity because it was a moment where uh, the, the local community really embraced and learned a lot from um, the, the Latino community, which is you know, an important step for us. So um, with that, I'll, I'll pass the baton on to Scott and thank you very much. Thank you, Whitney. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things I saw about building relationships um, as a really important part of that. So um, I hope that's something we can talk a little bit more about um, as we as we move along. Um, now I'll move on to um, Carolina Castoreno Santana. And Carolina, there she is, um, is executive director of the American Indian Center of Indiana. She's an enrolled member of the Lapan Apache tribe of Texas, and is also of Muscalero and Yaqui descent. Carolina is a writer, activist, student, and mother who's dedicated to social justice, the preservation of native identity, decolonization efforts, and education for and of indigenous peoples of the Americas. Her doctoral studies focus on indigenous communities and academic activism in Latin America. She's dedicated to improving the image and presence of AICI in the community and is presented on topics surrounding indigenous identity and rights around the country. Tancho, she eat Carolina Castorena Santana, she eat Chitze Lepai Inde, Chitcha, 
Um, buenas tardes, buenos días. Me llamo Carolina Castorano Santana. Yo soy Lipana Pache del estado de Texas y yo soy del familia Nutrial del Sol. Um, hello and good afternoon, good day. My name is Carolina Castorano Santana. I am um, Lipana Pache from the state of Texas and I am from the Sun Otter clan. Um, so I traditionally do my introduction trilingually as I am currently in the process of learning um, to be more um, fluent in my Apache dialect. Um, so, but the reason I do that is that is actually the language path of my grandfather. My grandfather, um, his first language was Apache, his second language was Spanish, um, and his third language was English. So it's kind of a way for us to reclaim um, what has been lost, which is very much the topic of what I'm uh, going to be talking about today. Um, and just, you know, like a real quick thing. So um, I'm the executive director, as Scott said, of the American Indian Center of Indiana. Um, so we are an organization located here in Indianapolis and we serve natives living in um, all parts of Indiana. Um, we have different programs. So our primary focus is on eliminating barriers to employment. Uh, so we do a lot with kind of in, um, employment training, uh, workforce development, uh, education as well. So that includes scholarships, certifications, uh, sending our community members to trade school, whatever the case is, in order for them to develop skills they need uh, to be self-sufficient. Um, and then we also do some emergency services along with that because we do have a, a significant portion of our population, especially here in Indiana, living below the poverty line or right at it. And so we have a lot of emergency situations that come up with uh, regard to housing, utilities, um, food insecurity, and um, substance abuse. Uh, so we are also working on a project in order to bring more uh, training for people to be able to work with Native people um, in the area of alcoholism and substance abuse with a Native focus as many of the um, programs that already exist out there are very faith-based and so have a tendency to leave out Native people and our and the respect for our cultural um, you know wishes and understandings and then we also do a lot surrounding um, health education regarding disparities that specifically affect the Native American community and we also do a lot of civic engagement, which uh, so currently right now we're working on programs that are get out the vote. We had a massive campaign on getting Native Americans in Indiana counted on the census, which also involved educating others about what the term American Indian means and extending that to people who are from Canada and Latin America and making sure that if they are of indigenous origin, they are identifying so on the census um, so that we have more accurate numbers. Um, and then we do a lot of cultural awareness and training and presentations um, and going out into the community and schools and educating about uh, historic references um, and cultural aspects regarding Native communities, but also making people aware of what na the Native community in Indiana looks like today. We are an urban Indian society. Um, so I don't have a um, very detailed presentation, but I, because this is actually going to be part of a larger conversation. So I wanted to at least show you this slide and then I think I have a picture right after it. Um, and so my focus is really about the necessity for collaboration between oppressed communities in order for, with regard to indigenous futures and how survival is going to continue to look and the necessity of working with other communities in, in order to ensure our survival. Um, and so it's um, entitled uh, which is leap and in my language means moving forward together, surviving colonialism through collaboration and solidarity among oppressed people. And so with the focus is being on collaboration, solidarity, survival, sovereignty, and community. So some of the ways in which we are doing that right now is we are taking an inventory of what the, what it looks like in, especially in central Indiana right now, to come from a minority community and what are the barriers that we are encountering when it comes to the many facets of our 
um, daily lives, whether it's economic justice, uh, social justice, educational justice, and how being from our specific communities is tied to what is going on in our current atmosphere. Um, so with regards to Indiana, there is this stigma that we are fighting uh, with invisibility and erasure. Now, granted, as indigenous people in uh, you know colonial settings such as the United States, Canada, and, and Mexico, and other countries, we are already facing that issue um, in general across the nation um, of erasure and invisibility. And so this is why there are concentrated efforts to bring attention to different issues such as missing and murdered indigenous women, uh, land back, you know, we saw with the no dapple and the protests against pipelines. A lot of this is directly tied to uh, the erasure of indigenous people in the present, which in turn in the future as well. So in Indiana, we have this, um, it's, it's a little more unique where Indiana is known for being land of the Indians but we were also mo most famous for our removal of Indians um, in the 19th century. So there is this myth out there that there are no more Indians in Indiana. And so we have to com combat that on a regular basis. Uh, the other issue is that with Indiana being what is considered a total urban Indian population, it means that we don't have reservation land here. Uh, we technically do not have any state or federally recognized tribes uh, that are fixed in Indiana. We do have the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi. They are considered a Michigan tribe because that is the majority of where their land base, that's where their reservation is, that's where their uh, majority of their population is. But they do have some land base here in Indiana um, and a presence because this is northern Indiana is their ancestral home as well. Um, and then we have a presence from other tribes, such as the Miami of Oklahoma uh, being here. Um, but, had, you know, as is indicated by the name, they are located primarily in Oklahoma. Uh, so we, a lot of the people we see in our office actually come from out west. Uh, so we have a lot, of, you know, a high population of uh, Navajos here and Lakotas from the various reservations in uh, North and South Dakota. Um, I myself am, you know, born and raised in Indiana, but my tribe is from Texas and my other tribes are from Mexico. Um, so that means that we have to do a lot of work and kind of getting people in the general public to understand, you know, what does being Native American in Indiana look like today, as opposed to this narrative that we have of um, Natives being forced off of Indiana into, into the West. <clears throat> when it comes to collaboration, uh, we are working through our various grants to work, uh, to, to get in touch with other communities of color, to find what our common needs are and our common struggles to see how we can overcome those. One of the ways we are doing that is with the get out the vote efforts and civic engagement efforts. Um, and our current um, slogan that we're using is democracy is indigenous because a lot of what people forget is that, <clears throat> excuse me, I need to have some tea. Uh, a lot of what people forget is how the founding of the United States is so heavily based on indigenous ideas of democracy and how we were governing ourselves prior to colonialism. And so there are really great resources out there that discuss the, the ties and the um, relationship to the Iroquois Confederacy and their agreements um, that led to the making of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and how that would shape democracy in the United States moving forward. So we are so often left out of the narrative, including when it comes to election time, that we are trying to bring back this idea that democracy is indigenous. This is something that is at the center of the majority of indigenous communities. Most tribes have a you know kind of democratic and communal way of governing and taking care of our people. And so it's only right for us to be able to express ourselves by having a voice in what's going on in, um, in 2020 and beyond. Excuse me. <clears throat> so we are 
part of the National Urban Indian Family Coalition. And they are based out of Seattle, but they are made up of several different uh, coalition members that are mostly um, urban Indian organizations like ourselves. And so there are several throughout the Dakotas, Minneapolis, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, California, Texas, um, even on the East Coast. So we are all trying to get together, take these bigger ideas and see how they fit into the, the realities of where we are in these urban areas in the Midwest, for instance. So that is part of our, our bigger idea is, um, is to be able to feed off of others and <clears throat> uh, idea wise to express what the needs are on a local level. So when it comes to the local level, a big part of that is collaborating with those who are around us, especially in states and cities where we have a significantly smaller population of native people, such as here in Indianapolis and basically the entire state of Indiana. So the easiest way to do that is to look at the communities that are facing very similar statistics in our area, and that would be the Black community and the Latino community, mostly here in central Indiana. Um, so, and I'll show you, this picture is from an event that we recently did a few weeks ago, and we were partnering with La Plaza and other members of the Latino community because we also want to really focus in on that, um, the aspect that the majority of Latinos, especially who we are seeing come from Mexico and Central America, are themselves indigenous and considered American Indian. Whether they are recognized members of a tribe is uh, or not, varies depending on the country they come from and how that recognition process works. But a lot of our, um, a lot of our common goals, a lot of the aspects that are very central to our culture, our way of communication, our way of educating our youth and um, passing on our culture, a lot of those are very similar to, no matter whether you are fr indigenous from uh, parts of North America, Central America, or South America. Um, so we did this and this is, a, a, a specifically difficult year <laughs> considering COVID-19. So a lot of the work that we do um, on a regular basis is heavily focused on gatherings. And um, that is something that's very essential to Native communities, especially during the fall. This is the time of the harvest. This is the time of, you know, giving thanks to uh, Mother Earth and Creator for providing for us, giving thanks to our community members for, you know, being in this together. So this has been challenging for us when this is something where we usually have a series of events where we're able to highlight our culture, highlight our achievements, and then also talk about our disparities and, and brainstorm on how we're going to move forward. Uh, and this year we're having to move that mostly virtual. But what was really great about this event is that we took the opportunity of you know, the need for people to be aware about their status during COVID. And so uh, La Plaza and the Indiana State Health Department hosted a drive-through COVID testing where you were able to drive through and get a nasal swab to, for the COVID testing, uh, blood drawn for the um, antibodies testing. And then you could circle around and you were able to get um, a flu shot. And then you could come to our table where we were highlighting the importance of uh, doing the census so they could do the census right there with us and they could register to vote. The reason why, how this is all kind of tied to um, indigenous futures is that, as I was saying before, our future and our survival um, through this atmosphere is very much contingent upon us being an active part of what is going on around us. And so a lot of the feedback that we've received uh, when we've held kind of uh, these informal, um, what would you, uh, essentially town halls um, <laughs> in our community, a lot of the feedback we received uh, initially is that many of our community members were disinterested in uh, presidential and local politics. Uh, people do not feel that our voices are ever considered significantly. 
We don't feel that anyone is actively trying to get our vote. We don't feel that people are listening to our concerns and doing much with that after the fact. And we don't feel that we are significantly represented in many areas. And so that was a big clue to us that we have to really figure out how do we make this more, how do we make this um, drive home this point that we need to be engaged in this process. And so we are working with these other communities that may experience more visibility, but are facing, like I said, very similar statistics when it comes to homelessness, mental health, substance abuse, um, poverty, all of these things that we have very similar statistics um, with the Latino and African American community. And so how can we partner together? So we are working on doing events together that are educating primarily each other about each group. So we're learning more about each group um, with the experiences that they've had and how that relates to our own, how it differs from our own and what that means to um, center certain people at certain times. So there are a lot of, um, this, is, this is actually, Central Indiana is actually um, a really great grassroots community. I think that people overlook that a lot of times. So we see a lot of um, civic engagement in many ways, not just in the voting realm, um, but also in you know, protesting and advocating and um, you know, fighting for different types of bills in, in the state house, whatever, and on a local level. And um, especially on city council, we see, we're seeing a lot of change in different communities um, throughout central Indiana on that, in that respect. And so this is how we are able to talk about certain issues and make sure that the people who are primarily affected by those issues are the voices being centered at that time. And it allows us to kind of escape this uh, crabs in a barrel mentality, because what a lot of people don't understand uh, about why there has not been more significant unification between oppressed communities in the history of the United States is because there have been very concentrated efforts to, uh, to pit everyone against one another. <laughs> and, and, and so we get what's this, what's considered um, oppression Olympics, and that we are not a you know, we don't have the capacity to advocate for one another because we have to focus on our own. But what we are seeing, um, and I actually am, am on the newly formed Indiana Racial Justice Alliance. So this is addressing issues that are affecting all of our communities. What we are seeing is that when we are coming together to the table and listening to our shared experiences and understanding the differences, we are actually able to approach the matter more um, pragmatically. And, and, and we are able to accomplish more. So that is, um, in a nutshell, a lot of what we are trying to focus on here at the American Indian Center. Um, you know, and to reiterate that, it's combating invisibility, it's reminding people what it means to be Native American in the Indiana today, uh, in 2020 and moving forward. And how we move forward is by relating to other oppressed communities, finding these commonalities and finding ways that we can work together. Um, so whether it's, you know, some may have told the story at that moment and some may hold the numbers and how do we bring those together um, in a sense that allows this narrative, you know, to get our voices heard and to um, ensure our survival for decades to come. And so in, you know, in native cultures, we're always talking about seven generations looking seven generations back and looking seven generations forward. It is very important when you talk about the indigenous um, mentality with regards to the future is that the past and the future are not necessarily two completely different places. They are very much connected at all times. And that has a lot to do with kind of like this cyclical way of which we, of we look at life. And if you think of that in a cyclical way, it also emphasizes the importance of the solidarity that we're speaking of. So I hope that wasn't too much rambling. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was great, Carolina. Thank you. I, um, I'll just, um, just to move along here, I'll save my comments until after um, the next presenter. Um, but I'd like to, to pass it on to um, Ola Lake and Jayafus, um, who's a visual artist um, and has exhibited. Ooh. 
Ooh. Hey, Scott, can you unmute yourself really quickly? <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, let me let me start over. Um, so I'd like to introduce <laughs> um, Ola Lake and Jayafus, um, who's a visual artist who's exhibited at venues such as Studio Museum in Harlem, MoMA, and the Guggenheim Bilbao. He's a New York Foundation of the Arts Fellow, has received grants from New York State Council and the Bro Brooklyn Arts Council. He's recently completed artist residencies with the Drawing Center's Open Sessions Program and the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center. In addition to his extensive exhibition history, he spent over a decade creating large scale public artwork. Hello, all right, Scott, thank you so much for that warm introduction. Um, hello everyone, I'm excited to be here. Thank you very much for having me. I'm gonna just jump right into um, some of my, some of my uh, recent art projects. And I hope you can all hear me and I hope you can all see the screen. Uh, variant narratives slash features. I realize that oftentimes my work sort of amplifies um, uh, com communities or voices that, that, that may not uh, be that visible in sort of the present um, dominant narrative. Um, I practice as a visual artist. I have a background in architecture. Um, I divide my time almost equally between uh, sort of speculative architectural imaginaries, uh, very sci-fi inspired, as well as public art um, that, that, that engages with a variety of communities. Um, this is an image called Shanty Megastructures for Lagos, Nigeria. And it's a project that I started back in 2015. And what I was really interested in at that time, um, and still now the project has gone through a variety of iterations, um, two things. One was sort of reflecting on uh, the ways that uh, sort of large scale urban developments very often um, at best just overlooks marginalized communities. And this occurs all over the world. Um, but in Nigeria, some 65% of the population of Lagos, Nigeria, reside in informal settlements and slums. Um, so that's something that I wanted to, to sort of focus on. Also consider the way that these communities um, are actually very highly self-organized and engage in a variety of sustainability practices, both as a function of necessity, but as ingenuity. Um, and thirdly, I was really interested in, I'm, in I'm, I'm very much inspired by science fiction. I think science fiction takes contemporary issues um, and projects them into the future, either in ways that um, go in a dystopian direction or that go in a kind of utopian direction or a blend of the two, which would be a kind of heterotopian way of looking at the future. Um, I'm also interested in, in sort of challenging the kind of prevailing Western visual um, examples of, of what is futuristic, right? And so, uh, which is often, you know, high tech, glass, steel, metal, and a lot of these um, more permanent materials. And I'm thinking of, of sort of these communities um, that engage in these practices that, that involve more of an ecological and environmental relationship, um, you know, with the earth, with animals and the like, and with the sort of natural evolution of, of sort of human populations. Um, so I'm imagining for this project, Shanty Mega Structures of Lagos, Nigeria, thinking of informal settlements um, at the scale of large scale commercial developments and projecting them into spaces of privileged um, real estate within Nigeria um, as a means of kind of extending visibility to these communities um, in the future. I know um, uh, Carolina, you know, discussed visibility of, of, of sort of communities, um, their, their presence in the future. You know, a lot of these informal settlements or slums are considered eyesores and, and um, either overlooked or sort of openly derided. Um, and so one of the more recent iterations of this project is then to move from the architecture, the sort of architectural language 
of these large cylindrical space frames that would house these communities within. And just, I've started creating these black and white, very simple, um, both analog digital collages of what the interior life of this um, world would look like, the sort of science fiction world that I've created. And again, thinking of, you know, from the vantage point of a kind of eco-futurism um, and it's interesting, I've, I've actually been working on this project before COVID. Um, so you've seen the woman on the right with the masks. I was thinking of sort of the, you know, air quality um, and, 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 and aeroponic farming and aquaponic farming and sort of ways that um, communities could, could, you know, create sort of sustainable um, practices within, within um, particularly those that suffer from kind of being in food deserts. More recently, I've sort of brought this similar sort of ethos of the shanty megastructures to Brooklyn, where I've resided for 20 years, with a series that I'm sort of informally calling Brooklyn Afro Eco Agro Futures. Um, <clears throat> and this is a rendering um, from a photograph I, I've taken from my rooftop, looking between two, uh, two, two newer sort of luxury condo developments that are directly across the street from me. Um, and as I mentioned, I've lived in Brooklyn for 20 years in Crown Heights, very specifically, and I've seen the, the neighborhood undergo a huge sort of transformation in terms of gentrification over the years. Um, and this project also started with me kind of thinking about the pandemic um, and the cracks in the infrastructure that were revealed, you know, the, 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 the institutions that we believe have sustained us. Um, so I started thinking of a futuristic Brooklyn eco settlement that also referenced, you know, some of the vanishing architectural uh, urban ephemera like the bodega storefront. So this one is uh, this image is titled the uh, um, bodega eco eco haven. So I bring back a lot of the sort of facade, um, you know, bodega aesthetic that has, you know, kind of a very profound sort of cultural um, presence, um, you know, in the imagination when one thinks of places of New York City, uh, particularly one thinks of hip hop and, and, and the like. And, and, and I've seen a lot of the sort of bodega storefronts begin to vanish from the neighborhood or get facelifts to accommodate, um, you know, the, the sort of new populace. I'm also thinking of, you know, the last image was on the rooftop. And so I'm considering just the sort of interstitial spaces and so this is um, not too far from where I live in the Bed-Stuy uh, neighborhood. And this is, um, I'm calling this the uh, Bed-Stuy bubble farm. So the idea is that between this little narrow space between buildings um, are these very small kind of um, bubble microclimates where you could basically grow a variety of, you know, food and produce that wouldn't necessarily be native to um, our, our climate here. And then this is again, um, series of photographs that I created these montages from back on my roof, thinking of a rainwater harvesting system. So again, I'm, you know, really thinking, you know, this future that involves, um, you know, longstanding communities of Brooklyn, particularly the Caribbean community, um, which has been largely displaced, but also thinking of, um, variety of these kind of, uh, ecological technological advancements um, that, 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 that lead to more sustainability. In my public art practice, um, I've, I've been at it for a few years. It's been immensely exciting and enjoyable to kind of combine. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of a great way to reconcile my architectural background. And one of the first projects was called Protest. And it was in Cleveland, um, Ohio and downtown area called um, Public Square. Public Square has a very long and storied history uh, within Cleveland of being a site where demonstration uh, and protest is sanctioned. One can, one can exercise this constitutional right without fear of reprisals. So I wanted to create a series of um, four large uh, sculptural profiles. They're roughly 12 feet tall um, that depicts you know, various examples of, of protest. Um, you know, you have the woman yelling into the megaphone very passionately to the far right. You have a person handing out pamphlets um, to the far left. 
we have, I guess, two protesters in, in a moment of, of uh, reconciliation. On an average day, uh, it's downtown, so people will just take their lunch breaks. So it's more of a kind of passive engagement with the um, installation. But there were several really notable protests that took place that year. The first was the Women's March. And so it was really exciting to see the artwork uh, engage with the community, um, as well as, you know, people really sort of embrace it. And, 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 and in a way, um, exciting to see the artwork kind of amplify the, the, the message of each of these uh, protests that took place. Um, the next one was the March for Our Lives around uh, banning assault weapons, as you see is that, in, in that poster right there. And then I think that juxtaposition between, um, you know, the poster and the woman yelling into the mic, uh, you know, yelling into the megaphone, uh, such, a, such an exciting sort of relationship to again see um, with the community um, uh, engaging with this, with this artwork. Another project that I finished recently was a building garage wrap in 2018 in Durham, North Carolina. And this project involved some heavy engagement with the community. Um, the, the, the project is part of a program called a Smart Vision Plan to Revitalize Downtown Durham. And it was really about connecting three distinct zones within Durham. Um, you see the illustrations on the, on the left and on the bottom. And these zones were the historic district, uh, the central district, and then the central park district. Um, which is sort of more community oriented space. And so I started with creating very simple isometric illustrations of the architectural vernacular for each of these spaces and use this, um, use these isometric drawings to create a very long landscape collage. Um, and then presented that as my proposal and, and was selected to move forward. Um, I then held a series of community engagements with several high schools. Um, you see the image to the right on the top is, is, is one high school. Um, and on the bottom is an after school program for the Duke Nasher teens. And I, you know, got a lot of their feedback and, and, and sort of had conversations about what about Durham really resonated with them. I also spoke to a senior center um, and they discussed um, you know, a lot of the uh, sort of understated involvement of, of Durham during the civil rights movement. Uh, Polly Murray's is from Durham. Um, and, you know, and, and also the kind of uh, history of, of, of Durham. They had, uh, you know, the Merchants and Farmers Bank, which is the first black owned bank. Um, and so then I was able to bring these, you know, bring symbols of, of, of these various elements. Um, you see in the three banners on the left is a facade of the Merchants and Farmers Bank. And then the brick, a uh, pile of bricks, you see Polly Murray's family um, owned a brick making company. So very much about, you know, self-reliance within uh, the black community. Um, and that was the distinct signature pattern of on the bricks, a sort of spiral. Um, and the beacon, of course, is, is referencing the civil rights movement. On the right, the teens were really sort of enamored with the fact that um, Bull, uh, Durham is called Bull City. And so the bull is ubiquitous. There's a fact right across the street, there's two large bull signs. And so I was asking them, you know, well, how can I reference that without just adding another bull? And they mentioned, you know, the hand sign with the, with the, with the horns. And so that was really a way to engage with the community to sort of bring to life, um, you know, elements that they thought were really in, in important and that would really resonate on a very specific level uh, through this artwork. Um, so this is a large um, aerial view. You can really get a sense of the scale of this. It's almost a full city block and, um, you know, really peppered with these elements that, that kind of reflect the community. A recent project was called The Boom and the Bust. It was part of the Art Prize Project 1 and the theme was Cross Lines. Um, Art Prize is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the boom and the bust for me, I was really looking at um, the history of redlining um, it within, within um, Grand Rapids and sort of interested in that kind of very predatory practice of denying, um, you know, bank loans to, to predominantly black and, and, and um, Hispanic communities. Um, and, and, you know, they're, thereby not allowing those communities to really grow in a kind of organic way. Um, but on the face of it, 
the boom refers to if you sort of look at the statistics uh, of Dur uh, sorry of of Grand Rapids, it's uh, reflects a sort of huge economic boom for the city. And there's a lot of development going on downtown, and that is where my installation was sited, um, right downtown across from the museum. And so I wanted to create an installation that would reflect these two narratives, right? Because once you started to investigate um, the particular numbers, uh, looking at the census along, you know, racial lines of the Black and Hispanic communities, there, there really was a disparity between economic boom and and homelessness, and um, you know, the paucity of a, of of, a, of available affordable homes. Um, for families to, to you know, uh, own and live in. So you had kind of this, you know, um, people living out of cars or people temporarily living in, in hotels um, or in shelters. So I, so I wanted to reflect the dual narrative, aka the boom and the bust. And so I created this installation, which sort of this large, massive commercial development, just keeping the materials really raw. Because for me, part of what I see when a neighborhood be really begins to transform is a lot of the construction really signals a transformation of that community and the displacement of residents within that community. So I wanted to keep this very raw, um, but also be suggestive of a large commercial development and then have it bifurcated by the steel grid of these, uh, where these smaller red houses uh, reside. And, you know, red often reflects a kind of negative statistic. Um, so it's the idea of really juxtaposing uh, these, these sort of dual narratives and in a sense um, exposing the, the sort of um, narrative of, of, you know, the lack of available and affordable housing. My most recent installation is currently in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, and unfortunately, its uh, term ends very shortly in November. It's called Rotten It Labors and Legacies. Um, it resides at Waterfront Park and it features a series of um, sculptural silhouettes as well as a ground mural. And um, one of the things that really struck me about Alexandria, Virginia is this really quaint, beautiful uh, sort of pastoral community. It's right on the waterfront. It has a lot of boutiques um, you know, and, and just this sort of very fun, you know, kind of pleasant, walkable city, but it, 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 it is home to the largest domestic slave trade in the United States. Um, and we often think of the transatlantic slave trade, but don't often think of slaves being sold uh, further south. And, and, and Alexandria, Virginia was, was a site of, of, of one of the main um, slave offices, companies that, that, that did exactly that. And I also think of when we think of the history of, um, actually, let me go back to this slide. When we think of the history of slavery in terms of the history of this country, it's so often completely separated out from the narrative. It's, it's almost like an alternative narrative. And so what I wanted to do was really bring those two together to say that they're very inextricably woven together, particularly in Alexandria, Virginia, where both the labor of enslaved people and the free black community contributed so much to its kind of merchants and industrial and, and industrial and commercial history. And so that's what these figures, each of these figures literally um, through a kind of ornate wrought, uh, wrought iron patterning embody um, icons that reflect the four uh, various major commercial enterprises, um, the railroad, uh, the tobacco industry, um, wheat, and as well as the shipping sort of and, and fishing industry. And the ground plane um, really picks up on the um, African-American quilting tradition as a sort of both a creative way of storytelling, um, an inventive way of storytelling, but also as a form of, you know, resilience and, and resistance um, and, and sort of passing down oral history. So more icons um, that kind of reflect the Alexandria community are, are placed within, you know, the sort of quilted pattern on the ground plane with these sculptures facing the water. Um, and at nighttime, they're very, you know, they're, they're lit very subtly. There's just um, four very kind of low uh, solar lights that, that illuminate them from below. And so you get these really nice nighttime silhouettes 
um, of, of the installation. And here's sort of a, a view after a evening rain. Um, and it, it, again, it's, it's, it's something that I, I had several sort of community meetings to discuss the kind of history of Alexandria to make sure that I was reflecting um, those particular histories in kind of an honest and accurate way um, and that it would resonate with, you know, people who are from um, this, this city. And it, it was installed just before the pandemic. I was very lucky, like literally three days before uh, the, the, the country basically went into lockdown. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to make it back since, but it's been really exciting to, uh, through Instagram, you know, see a variety of, you know, people engaging with the artwork. Again, just sitting on the benches, enjoying, you know, a nice summer day. Um, I've gotten a lot of, you know, messages about how, you know, people have been using them as kind of an educational device to really share some of the history and discuss the artwork. Um, it's, it also finds itself kind of right within the conversation we've been having as a country around, um, you know, what and whom should be memorialized. And so this is sort of um, involved within that particular discourse. These characters do not reflect any one individual, but more a kind of broader history. And um, within Alexandria, Virginia is home to several, you know, um, Confederate statues. And of course, we've been sort of challenging the idea of, of these of these statues. Um, so thank you very much. That's That's my time. Well, that was wonderful. Um, I think we, we've gone a little bit over, so we're going to um, uh, hopefully everybody can stay with us for about 10 more minutes. Um, I'd like to invite all the other um, panelists to come back in um, and we could chat a little bit. Um, I, I just kind of want to, well, I just want to thank you all um, for some really great um, discussions. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that really, I think, that ties all these together is that idea of relationality. Um, and, and how do you, I guess, how do we recenter sort of that idea um, in the communities, uh, in your work and in, in the communities that you work with? And I guess, how do we, what are the challenges around that? And how do we imagine what can that look like in the future? Um. Any, any of us are, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you, you know, for me, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And that's something that I really have to contend with um, now practicing very often as a public artist. I go into cities and communities that I very, you know, for the most part, I know absolutely nothing about these communities, um, the people who live there, the history. So I have to sort of give myself a crash course um, and understand the broader overview, you know, both from, you know, the environments of, of, of a particular space, um, the various demographics, the history. Um, and I make it a point as myself to, to, to have a component of the work that I create um, reflect my conversations with the community. Um, and, and that also speaks to the challenge. The challenge is, of course, you cannot include everything everyone wants to add, right? Um, and in a certain sense, sometimes coming from another space and not being, you know, native to a particular community um, can, can be an advantage because, you know, when I speak to various different groups, you know, you can ask one person what's the most significant thing about this city and it'll differ vastly given their particular experiences from someone else. And this can be along um, ethnic, racial and class, you know, class lines. So the idea of sort of finding a, 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 um, uh, something that connects varying communities goes very much back to, you know, um, what, you're, what you're reflecting on around relationality, right? And, 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 and how we do that. Um, and I think that comes from having those conversations, um, as well as interdisciplinary, um, you know, practices that include community members, landscape architects, arch you know, a variety of, of, of folks who have a vested interest in a community. Um, as we know, architecturally, so often, it's driven much more by 
the real estate industrial complex, you know, is, is how, how, you know, folks go into buildings and build, you know, um, whatever they build is literally driven by um, a very capitalist real estate structure, you know, so operating from the community is a sort of a way to begin to chip away at that. I think something that's so important, though, as I think about the last sort of six months and in your beautiful work in Alexandria was really, you know, coming at it from an emotional uh, perspective. I think many people have grown up with facts in their um, education and um, and sometimes not exactly the right facts or not all of the facts. You know, when I think about a lot of the immigrants that are coming in from Guatemala, for example, that are into this specific, specific area, you yeah. know, understanding why they're coming here and what it was in their past that has put them on this like really awful future and how the U.S. has played a part in that, right? And mm -hmm. so when I think about the, um, uh, the discussions going on about race today, one part that has really stood out to me and been really significant for me personally has been the personal stories and the amount of strife that have gone into them and the way that they are carried in an individual every day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if I think the beauty of, of some of the work that you've done is that it really places that in the forefront of everyday sort of interactions, you know, you're crossing squares, public squares, or going down to the water to run or something like that, you're putting it in their face, but not mm -hmm. in a, um, you know, in a way that, that is, edu you know, educating, as opposed to perhaps getting someone, you know, even more upset on the other side of things, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's really wonderful. So congratulations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was gonna say, like, playing off of what both Lake and Whitney just said, like, it's really important because, so when I was talking earlier about, like, the past being, you know, and explicitly linked to the future, and, like, so I think, like, one of the biggest issues that we hear um, when it comes to, like, current events or, like, whatever the case is, um, it's that, you know, why can't we get over it? Why can't we leave it in the past? Why do we have to uh, erase history? And it's, and it's literally like, if we do not, you know, place that into context now, um, it, 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 it will, it, you know, it affects our future. And so it's very necessary to link what's going on um, right now with why things are the way they are. And so like, even with speaking about, like you were talking about the communities of Guatemala. So even at that mm -hmm. event that we did, um, this is why the discussion of indigeneity is so important and what it means to be indigenous. So when we think of indigenous capital I, like from the Western hemisphere standpoint, that's one thing. And we're talking about without borders. We're literally talking mm -hmm. about indigenous people are from the tip of Alaska to the tip of Tierra del Fuego but representing different tribes in between. And this construct of borders is a European import. And then we also think about indigenous globally. So we're talking about indigenous tribes in Africa, indigenous communities in New Zealand and Asia and Australia, et cetera. Even, new, even indigenous communities in Europe um, that have, because we're all indigenous at some point. And what does that mean? Um, so that's a good, there's two reasons why I bring that up. One is, we deal a lot with cultural appropriation in the indigenous community and the fact that um, that people can look to their own indigenous roots, um, you know, for that kind of like whatever it is that they are trying to obtain. They do not have to take from another community. They can look into themselves and their own history on how to move forward. Um, and then the other thing is like the, that event that we did, for instance, um, why it's important to talk about indigenous uh, to the Americas and not just the U.S., we were, I, I was helping translate because I, I, coming from tribes, from border tribes, I speak Spanish as well. Um, I was helping to interpret, excuse me, when they were registering a family and the very first family I was helping, they were about to skip over the race question and mark other because they put under ethnicity Latino um, and because they had, a, you know, a consular ID from Guatemala, they put okay, country, Guatemala, but they were going to skip it. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, you're not asking that. 
Um, and the fact it's not just about me being incessant, like, yes, most Latinos are indigenous and we need to be having them identify that way. This was literally a Mayan family um, from a Mayan community in Guatemala. And so as soon as I asked the question, it wasn't even a hesitation. They're like, yes. Like one of the last names, they have two last names, and one of the last names is in a Mayan language. And so that affects so much, like you're saying. Uh, you know, we, we talk about like, why is it that, you know, what has our country, the role of our country been in causing these migrations? But also the fact that when we, um, when there's a crisis at the border and people are needing interpreters. They're not just needing Spanish speakers. They are literally needing people who speak Mesoamerican indigenous languages. And that has a, so much to do about what does that have to do with, you know, time. It's because Mayan people, the, the people, the, uh, excuse me, society believes that Mayans are the ancestors. They are the past and they are very much living and thriving, existing people of the present. And in order to maintain that future, we have to stop erasing that narrative of what is going on and what is driving, you know, um, their experiences now. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, that going back to what you were talking about earlier, Carolina, the idea that, um, you know, indigenous peoples have been relegated to the periphery um, in terms of time and space and place. Um, and that, you know, we, in sort of the American imagination, we only exist in the past and we exist somewhere else. Um, and not acknowledging that, you know, it's, it's even hard to imagine this part of the present, let alone the future. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of those sort of that public education is just, so important for people to see us and recognize that we are still here and i think with all of your work um you know you're 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 elevating those voices and those narratives that have been erased silenced suppressed um and ignored um and so i think that you know yeah what are ways that that all of that can be a part of that and sort of the collaboration with communities and and that it's always you know having indigenous peoples as a part of this is, it's, it's just a, a natural part of, of what we do as a society that, um, you know, recognizing, you know, that we are part of your everyday community. Um, and that even though we might be invisible, we're still here. Um, gosh, I could, we, I guess we could keep going and going and going. But. <laughs> Um, I think I think that's probably a good place to wrap up unless anybody any analysts had any other thing that um, kind of um, on their minds that um, um, they'd like to discuss but oh I see Anne Sirak is has appeared so that might be telling us that that it's time to stop <laughs> but I really enjoyed this discussion you guys are all great yeah I don't want it to end I thank <laughs> everybody for staying you know, longer than expected, but also I, I feel like I'd love to invite you back to like continue this conversation as we move forward um, into the next year um, as well. And I'm, I'm just so excited to see um, Lake come welcome him to our community and to have him thinking about this like really wonderful public place as the library plaza and like what might happen there. So thank you, uh, Whitney and Carolina, um, Lake um, and Scott for being a part of this today. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for being so open and um, really talking about the important work that you're doing in the world. So thank you. Um, a huge thank you to all of our participants in this year's Exhibit Columbus Symposium. Um, this is our last event um, that we're closing right now. Um, to our curators, Mimi Zeiger and Iker Gill for putting together this incredible, incredible group of people. Um, Thanks to the rest of our Exhibit Columbus team, Janice Shimizu, Ben Valentine, Hadley Fruits, and Richard McCoy. The music uh, during our program today was created by Ryan Lott and was gener generously provided by This Is Maru. Uh, for those that missed our thematic conversation streamed earlier this week through Dazine, visit our website, exhibitcolumbus.org, uh, to watch that program or any of the other seven conversations we've produced over the last six weeks. Uh, thanks to all of you in our audience um, who participated in our programming. As we learn with uh, each cycle of Exhibit Columbus, uh, community can be very expansive. Um, and we've been really proud to invite this remarkable group of people 
from around the world to come together uh, with individuals doing important work in our community of Columbus, Indiana to explore these topics in really meaningful ways. Um, our symposium was free uh, and accessible to a public all around the world. Uh, this would not have been possible without the support of the Landmark Columbus Foundation Board of Directors, uh, stakeholders in our community, Indiana Humanities, uh, and generous donations made by people like you. So thank you very much. Um, stay connected to our work. Uh, follow us on social media. Sign up for our newsletter. Um, stay tuned for more exciting programming and events, um, including the design presentations uh, featuring all of our exhibition participants. And of course, our exhibition opening in August 2021. Uh, we have much to look forward to next year, and I really appreciate being able to look ahead with all of you. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.